a temporally existing. Um, so, so let's say, for instance, he a temporally, uh, I don't know, knows all of the mathematical truths or something. Well, then the creation of the universe shouldn't change that. Whatever facts there are true about him that are atemporal can't, and by definition, can't change as time carries on. So you think that that would stay the same, and it would be a genuinely new addition to things that now he knows that the world exists or something. I don't know. But I don't know. Maybe he doesn't avoid this problem. Of course. So, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying there is that the active part of God's being an active infinity doesn't strictly consist in, because, I mean, what you're getting, I think, with the active infinities is that one is increasing or, like, adding, you know, more to, let's say, the set of truths or class of truths or whatever that God knows, Mm -hmm. while the number remains the same, which Craig argues argues against, given Hilbert's hotel and the infinite library and and, and so forth, right? and, and then, of course, that, that's a problem. Um, and then the, the move that I was sort of suggesting on Craig's behalf is that he could say that instead um, there isn't actually a net gain of any beliefs. All that's happening is that his beliefs are changing, but they're not, one isn't increasing the number of beliefs that he's having. Because for every new belief he acquires, he gives one up at the same time, so there's no net addition of beliefs. Hmm. Um, and what it seems you're saying now is that the the addition of new beliefs over and above his already infinite stock of beliefs um, is not intratemporal. It's not with respect to how you know his beliefs switch as time passes. You know, something that was once false becomes true, and something that was once true becomes false, and so forth. Rather, the the, the part where he he does acquire a new stock of beliefs um, that's a genuine addition is at the very moment of time, given his idiosyncratic yeah, view yeah, of God's yeah. relationship well, I think, to time. I did, you know, thinking about it more, I think we can make things a lot easier, because I think going towards that beginning of time thing, it's really messy. Uh, so I think here's the right way to look at it, because um, the claim doesn't have to be about all of God's knowledge. So, okay, like, so if God knows that it's... Uh, so say, say say there's only one proposition that's true for some reason, and all of the other propositions, atomic propositions, say all, all of the other ones are false. Right? Um, well, God knows that that's the way things are. That this one's true, and He also knows that it's true that you know. So say P is the true one. Um, he also knows that it's true that Q is false. And he knows it's Q mm. that R is false, or whatever. Right. So in a sense, when uh, Q joins P being true as well in the next moment. Your claim really is something that seems to me that God knows now that P and Q are true, but there's no additional truth because he, for, you know, like you said, he gave up the knowing that it was... There's not a change in the number of beliefs, in other words. Right, 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 right. Because he, he gave up knowing that Q was false. Right, So he still had at least three beliefs, and even though Q went from... Or at least he he knew three true things, even though Q went from being false to being true. No, I should I should make one caveat about that though, um, because I was thinking about this um, some more. I forget this is like called Grandy's sequence or something. Like we have the mm-hmm. one minus one plus one, but the paradox is actually the the solution. I mean, <laughs> like that itself is paradoxical because you would think the it would sum to zero, but there there are issues with it being zero. Where apparently the correct answer is one half or something. Like that. Um, but I'm, I'm just saying that, like, that even this move, I think, itself could be maybe subject to some problems. But barring that caveat, I mean, that is the idea that there's no, there's no change in the number of beliefs. Yeah, right. But so um, to make to to force it so that there is, what you could say is okay. So I mean, here's another way of thinking about it: is that um, even if he only knew one true thing, um, presumably he he'd know that he knew it, and he know that he knew that he knew it, blah, 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 right? So you get an, an infinite regress just there. Um, so, you, you know, you could say that, um, or uh, if he knows that it's currently sunny, he knew that it was going to be sunny, and he knew that it was going to be, that it was going to be sunny, blah, 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 right? So you can generate all of these kind of regresses. Um, so what you could do is just say something like, take God's knowledge of the bare atomic truths um, 
now he knows if there's only the case that P is true, yeah, we're, we're thinking about a set that contains one thing in it. Um, it's okay, I know that he also knows that Q is false, and he knows that it was going to be the case that Q is true, and he knows that he knows that blah, 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 right? All of those things are there. I'm just saying, if you just construct the argument where you only consider the subset of his knowledge which concerns atomic truths, um, you think that there's no reason why that couldn't be a finite number, right? I mean, it might be an infinite number, but it depends how. Depends on some kind of. It's, I don't know. Are there infinitely many? Like, just all positive existential truths, like there's an atom in this position, or something like that. Something or like that, yeah. Then, and crucially, the idea here would be not that um, it's true that it's false that there's two atoms in this position, right? Just, just the true, the fair atomic true ones. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe there's a finite number of them, or maybe, I don't know. But the idea would be, I mean, it could be the case anyway. It's conceivable that, that at some point in time. There is only one thing that's true in that sense. Um, and With respect to the bare atomic facts you're saying, when you're saying there's yeah, only one thing that's, that's true? Right. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Um, and if God is in the position of knowing that, um, and then came to know something else, uh, then you could say, well, look, with respect to the atomic facts, uh, God's knowledge is increased. Um, but then you could say that that's only a part of what he knows, and really, if you think about all of the things he knows together, it hasn't increased because it's cardinality infinite again in each case. So there you could sort of like, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head here really, to some extent, but like, I think you right. could probably just rephrase the situation so that, uh, so that it makes it a finite set increasing by one, say, when something happens. So the idea is that there are parts of God's knowledge that are genuinely increasing in number, in some sense? Right, right. I mean, maybe it's just easier to say something like, well, what God knows about... Um, this topic is genuine, genuinely increasing in number, or something? Yeah, exactly. Like, with respect to the bare, with respect to the bare atomic facts. Um, yeah, all the bare atomic facts that um, are true in this room right now, or something, or on my head right now. Mm in this whiskey glass right now or something, right? I don't know whether this works. I, I'm, I'm just feeling it out as an idea. Yeah. I wonder what Craig would say in reply to that. Um, what, what I guess I'm not strictly following is that there is a... I mean, among the bare atomic facts, um, are, you, are you looking at those as tense propositions as well? Like, such and such X exists or something? Is that a tense proposition on this on this model? Um, I would imagine, well, yeah, okay, so on the A theory model that Craig's going along with, um, an atomic proposition is like a present tense fact, but one that's like, mm -hmm. that doesn't um, directly entail a fact about the future. Like, if I say it is the case that um, this is my last glass of whiskey ever or something, that's, it is a present tense fact, but it somehow entails facts about the future as well, in, in the sense that I'm not going to drink any more whiskey again, something like that. So it wouldn't count as an atomic fact. But so it's anything it's, that doesn't it, that doesn't involve reference to the to the to the past or the future. That's something like that, yeah. That's right. So, so those would be the atomic facts that I would be thinking about. So, so just bare statements of uh, what what where stuff is, what properties it has right now. Right. Sure. There is a table in mm -hmm. this room or something. Um, yeah, right, right, right. And, and then if there's only a finite number of things, like in the first moments of his creation or something, as he makes new things, he comes to know, oh, now in addition to that existing, you know, Garden of Eden and Adam, now there exists Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve or something. And now he's come to know there's three things. I see. That he knows, right? But doesn't he believe the complement for every, like, because I was initially interpreting, like, bare atomic fact as something on the order of a positive existential truth or something. So, like, mm -hmm. there is a table in this room or the computer is doing X or something. Um, and for everything that's false, wouldn't he believe the complement of each of those ones? So he wouldn't just believe 
that P is true, he'd also believe that not Q and not R and not T and, and so on. Or are you not counting those as bare atomic facts? Well, uh, let's see. So, I mean, certainly it's right. I wouldn't say that if he right. So, what doesn't definitely doesn't count as a bare atomic fact would be like um, he knows that God of Eden exists. He knows that Adam exists. And then there's this third one, which is the conjunction of those two. That certainly doesn't count as an, ato an atomic fact, right? Okay. Um, right. I guess the negation is like there's an operation being applied to the atomic proposition that means it's complex rather than atomic. So in that sense, he doesn't know that straightforward complement or negation of, of, um, of those atomic facts that are false. He doesn't know that. So if it's false, then Eve exists. He doesn't know it's not the case that Eve exists because that's already a complex proposition. And not atomic. Or rather, his knowledge of that fact isn't one of the bare atomic facts. Yeah. I mean, presumably he knows it, but that, that's, that's a yeah, complex yeah, yeah. fact, not a... Not an right. atomic fact. And um, I mean, so I was trying to say at the beginning, we can kind of, we, we should carve out, uh, we should, I mean, there, yes, there's, there's all these different ways that you can come up with complex facts. Like he could believe that he believes that he believes and blah, 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 and that's a complex fact. Even if what it is that he's, the proposition that he's focusing on is atomic, I mean, yeah, yeah you could still have that. Or, or you could have a really complex conjunction of all of the many things that he knows or a tense combination or modal combination or something. But yeah, just trying to focus the argument down on there being this core kind of set of things that he knows which is simple. But I mean, I, I, it makes the argument less attractive because it's more ad hoc to have to come up with this. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, when, when I was reading your blog post, that was the first thing that sort of struck me about, because that sort of seemed to be like where the whole post was leading up to that God is an active infinity. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like right now what you're saying is either you would relocate the active part of God's, you know, body of knowledge to say the beginning of time or something, mm -hmm. or with this move about bare atomic facts. Mm -hmm. um, because I just feel like with the second route, Craig is going to resist this sort of uh, this restriction that you're making. Like you were saying, it might be viewed as ad hoc or gerrymandered in some way. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think well, the only way I could really get away with doing that would be if Craig used that same move for some other reason, and uh, and I was able to sort of point at him right. and say, "Yeah, well, you do this." You know, so. Yeah, I mean, that would, that would be perfect, actually, but I'm not sure if he does something like that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, it seems to leave things at a, an inconclusive place. I mean, I think the thing about um, the beginning of time is more promising, mm -hmm. because that does tie in directly to his, uh, his views on, on time, anyway. Um, and I don't think he would have a, because he does he does talk about how God comes to know a new fact in some sense mm -hmm. when he quote enters into time right like that that's something genuinely new he acquires in terms of knowledge right 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 because if there is something genuinely new that's true and presumably he couldn't uh, there wasn't a tense fact beforehand that it was going to be the case because um, he's creating time you know, whatever that is supposed to mean he's creating time and presumably uh, with it tense time right so it's, I mean it's really it's difficult for me to like, go down that because I find it so difficult I find it so incoherent the idea that you're I you know, before I created time. It probably isn't. Come now, after I've done it. Anyway. Well, I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that... Uh, does anyone else hold to Craig's view on time about that? Because I think almost everyone either goes with the everlasting view or the, like, God is, has always existed in time or something. 
where it got strictly atemporal, not this sort of hybrid model. Yeah, right, right. And it's normally omnitemporal or atemporal, I think. Um, yeah, this view is, is kind of bizarre. Uh, yeah, I don't know anyone else who holds that view, actually. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Um, um, what's that? Jeff Rasmussen? Josh Rasmussen. Okay, I don't know who that is. He's a philosopher of religion. I'm going to do a quick Google search. Mostly defends uh, contingency arguments. All right. I think he used to be a skeptic of the Kalam, but uh, I think, Jack, did you say that he's uh, become fond of it recently or something? Okay, so I can see Hugh is saying that Craig would deny that God knows an infinity of facts before the universe. Um, but why doesn't he also already know all of the mathematical facts before the universe? Well, I think he, he does that non-propositional knowledge route that you had discussed in your post. So there's not a genuine infinity of the facts that he knows. It's only one truth in some sense. Hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you can go the non-propositional route, then... Um, that's already uh, an escape route for even if you grant everything else that I said. Um, right, but you addressed that in your Yeah, uh, so I'm, which means that then, unless I'm wrong right from the get-go, I don't see how that works if God's exists if God's knowledge of mathematical truths before time has to be propositional. Uh, well, I think he says something to the effect that even if it was uh, non-propositional, it, it retains the multiplicity in some sense. Mm. Um, that's probably the only issue I had with your post. I, I did have some other thoughts. I think about I said. I think what oh, I sorry, said was that. Um, was that Rasmus? I think what I said to you was that Rasmussen's the only person that I know of who has Craig's view on time. Who's a professor? Right. But I I didn't get that from communication with him. I haven't talked to him in quite a while. It was just uh, something I I don't know. Maybe I learned that from Reyes. I I see. Well, we had a paper recently with uh, Cross about a related issue. Yeah, on Craig's model, the sense in which God changed is just this, when he created time, was merely that uh, he has different properties when he's temporal versus when he was atemporal. But that's not a temporal change. It doesn't take place over time or anything. And uh, Hugh Jidid was the one who pointed out that by that criterion, um, you know, Alvin Plantinga changes into William Lane Craig in the sense that they have different properties. So. That, was, that was actually in relation to uh, what I had emailed you, so I don't know if you'd want to talk about that now or... Yeah, it's fairly bare bones. I was working on a more extensive outline, but I've been fairly busy this, uh, yeah, this week so far. Okay, cool. I'm just going to quickly read through it then. Um, sure. sure. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, did you get a chance to read through it? Yeah, I've just had a look through it now. Um, so I think um, I think the point you're making was that there's this kind of 
um, if you want to deny the first premise, there's this counter accusation that Daniel committed to an absurd thesis, which is that the universe pops into existence out of a void of nothingness or something. And then the reply to that is simply just that uh, that's to kind of reify the nothingness or something. And that what you really mean is just that there's there's just a first moment of time, right? And that's that's all you know, all there is is the universe and it has it's finite in the past. It doesn't mean there's a preceding nothingness state that gives rise to it. Um, uh, right? That's that's the point you're trying to hammer home, is that that's... Well, I'm, I'm, I think I'm saying something a little bit more ambitious in that um, I think the way Craig utilizes that in the Kalam approach is question vagueness. Because he wants to say something to the effect that if you deny it, you are, you know, you land up in this absurdity, like you said. And the way he goes about arguing that itself begs the question to the extent that there's a cause in the universe or whatever. Um, because the only way he could characterize the coming to be of the universe is what I'm trying to argue towards at the end, is in some causal sense. So, of course, if begins to exist or comes to be just means has a cause, then the first premise is whatever has a cause has a cause. The universe has a cause. Therefore, the universe has a cause. That begs the question. So I, th- I feel like I'm still not quite getting it. So that um, you're saying that when he has to argue in a question-begging manner, right? Um, mm-hmm. And that's because it's this bit here. He says, I can take it instead that the coming to be of the universe was temporally sim- simultaneous but causally prior. So the universe comes to be in the sense that there's a causal, albeit non-temporal antecedent. And in this sense, the first interval of space-time sprang into being. And then you say, aha, and then you've, then you've begged the question. And so is the issue that um, the only... So how does it work? That the only causal sense in which, so the only way that you can have causation working there is as a, it's the combination of it being uh, temporally simultaneous but causally prior. And you're saying something like it being causally prior is just, the only content you can give to that is just the, the, Definition of that. Wait, wait, wait. So no, no, I'm, I'm trying to fill in too many blanks that I, I don't see clearly. So sorry. Can you just explain it to me another time before I um? Well, what what part of the thing? dialectic do you understand up to, or is it clear <laughs> up to? Well, I feel like it's clear. Um. Let me see. Like in the expanded version, I was going to write on this. I was going to give citations to where Craig basically makes each of the moves I attribute to him in this dialogue of the literature. Um, so like one, one thing that he says quite often, like with, with respect to the kind of reply that you give, that when you're saying the universe is uncaused but is past finite, you're not saying there's this nothingness that pops out of, you're just saying there was just this moment where it was just the first interval of time, that's all there was. Mm-hmm. When you're saying there isn't anything prior to it, you're not saying there's a nothingness out of which it springs, you're just saying it's the first interval of time, and that's all. Mm-hmm. And he wants to say that that's basically a beef you right view in some way, that that interval of time or space-time begins to exist in the same way the first inch of a ruler begins to exist or something. It, it demarcates the, the leading edge of that. And he, he concedes that in that sense the Kalam wouldn't have any bite. Um, but he wants to say he holds to a dynamic or tense theory of time in which each moment of time comes anew. It's a fresh, it's a fresh moment in some way. Um, so it's in this sense that the universe comes to be, right? It's, it's a 
Right, right. But that's still, right. as I think you point out, that's still absolutely fine for the view you're advocating. Like, um, you can just say there's the first moment and there is no, well, even in the A theory sense, there's no earlier or there's no past time from that moment, right? Like it's yeah, I mean, when we, when we use the solution like, like, when you say something like, when you, say something like, when you talk about temporal becoming, or coming into being, that that sort of begs the question: coming from where, right? Um, but of course, what's unique about the first moment or first interval of time, like with every other moment in time, like I like I say in that outline, you know, it's such that it is the future, will be the present, and then will become the past, right? Like you're you're with with moments of time that come into being. There's a sort of future-looking aspect to them, mm-hmm. where they can be future. But of course, the first moment of time was never the future. Right. It was right. only the present. And so we wouldn't say it came into being. We would say it passed out of being, at most. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And in that it sense, was, it's un- it was present, and now it's not anymore. Yeah. Right. As opposed to with other moments of time. Is the future, will be present, then will be past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would be true if the universe was finite towards the future. There would be a moment at the end where, um, while it's, it has, um, it, it's in anticipated by the earlier presence or something, um, it, it doesn't itself get to be a past moment. Right, it's a kind of symmetrical right. version of that right. too. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I don't see why that's problematic for an, on an A theory point of view, it just seems like... Right, that's and, and that's why I'm saying him bringing it up is sort of irrelevant. Mm. It, it's not properly characterizing in what sense the universe comes to be, like when he says comes to be, in some way that's relevant with respect to this issue. Because on both A theory and B theory, the way we analyze the first interval of time is just that. It's just the beginning. There's not anything prior, not in the sense there's nothing that's prior to it, but for anything, for all the things there are, none of them are prior to it, mm-hmm. which is the coherent way of um, expressing that truth. So there doesn't seem to be any way, even on A theory, to express in what sense the first interval of time, or the first moment of time, temporally comes into being. So he can't characterize the coming into being of the first interval of space-time in some temporal sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that clear? I mean, I seems to me that that's that 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 seems right, but um, I, I, I don't know whether Craig would agree to that because he already agree, he already seems to hold what I consider to be an incoherent view that um, about. God, in you know, some sense, is there before the universe exists, but not really before because there is no time. But that you know, you're still allowed to say that God pre-exists the creation of the universe because He's there to make it happen. Right, but He so, He pre-existed not in a temporal way, though, right? He caused. Uh, yeah, but that, what does that mean? I don't really get what that means. No, I, I agree that He's incoherent, but in this dialectic, yeah. I I don't I don't want to quite address that issue directly. I'm just right, trying right, to right, build an, an undercutting defeater here, not, not a strict rebutting defeater. Um, because there's, there's a line in the, in the dialogue where I say something to the effect of, uh, look, your, your causal principle leads to all of these really weird consequences, and I think that's a good reason. That's a reasonable um, justification for one not accepting that principle. Right. And Craig does say in the literature that he agrees that where his view leads is somewhat counterintuitive and very weird. But he thinks it's the best out of a stock of options which are more counterintuitive and arguably absurd than the one he's offering. Right. So there's a there's in the dialectic I see there's a critical role of him comparing his view to other alternatives, and he wants to argue the other alternatives are absurd or incoherent. And if he can't bring that out, then I think his argument loses a lot of force. 
So he right, needs right, there right. to be this, this sort of um, absurdity with respect to the, the view that I'm characterizing here that the skeptic could have, for example. Yes. So, okay. um, right. So I'm, I'm with you. Sorry. I'm with you on that definitely. So. Um. So okay. And with respect to his, uh, so so okay. So I st I'm still not clear about the last chunk of dialogue that you've got for Craig saying. Like that that paragraph to me isn't clear. Uh, so hopefully you could. Uh, which which one uh, is that? The last thing that Craig says, the last chunk of uh, text. That you've got for him. All right. Um, so so I think once you make that clarification, and as Craig says himself, the coming to be of the universe is not in the sense of some temporally prior state or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right, and and his I am, what I'm arguing is that his appeal to a theory is in some sense irrelevant. Right, I'm assuming yeah. that that argument's gone through. But what he's insisted throughout, like like when you just mentioned his view, right? Like you know, he goes from being a temporal to temporal. He enters into time in some sense. So in some sense, he pre-exists the first moment of time. Mm -hmm. That sense of pre-existence isn't one of temporal priority. He insists it's actually temporally simultaneous, but it's causally prior. In a sense, there's, a causally an, there's an antecedent causal state. So the, the priority is not temporally causal. I'm sorry? It's causally antecedent sen, um, state, but it's not a temporally antecedent state. Right. Because the idea is that he's, he's saying the universe comes into being in some sense. And I'm sort of doing this dialogue of saying, well, well, what do you mean by that? Mm. And we're sort of running through alternatives of, well, it can't be a temporal sense of coming into being, contrary to your objections. Right? And so we, we eliminate that. So what's the only alternative in the sense in which he means the universe comes into being? in the first and second premises of the Kalam, I'm saying that the only thing I think he can really appeal to at that point, as he's distinguished many a time elsewhere, is not to appeal to temporal priority, which we've excluded, but to appeal to causal priority. But of course, appealing to causal priority is just to mean, in some sense, there is a causal, causally antecedent state, which is to say that there is a cause of the universe. Right, right, right. So it's it's just uh, it's just another it's basically just another way of saying the same thing, right? That's what your um, allegation comes down to. So it's like if you want to get to this point and still insist that it has, uh, so so okay. So he's going, yeah, all right. Um, it it's it has a core. It there's some kind of causal antecedent for it, but but that's to be understood in a non-temporal manner. Okay, that's that's like the only uh, get out that he's got left, and then the point mm -hmm. then is that well, the kind of semantic content for uh, causally but non-temporally antecedent to the beginning of the universe is is just kind of nothing more than an empty label. It's just it just kind of like this thing springing up without. Um, the state of the universe being all that there is with no prior moment to it or whatever, which is your kind of otherwise fully defended uh, view that he can't characterize as absurd, can only be characterized as absurd if he is allowed to attach a label to it which says uh, causally antecedent. Um, and then your point is, I think, I think I'm getting this now, that um, all that it means to be causally antecedent is for there to be no actual temporal antecedent that's uh, kind of a nothingness or, or something that comes before it. So it's exactly the same as uh, just being all that there is. Right? Is, is that right? Is it just that it basically boils down to being exactly the same point that you're making? Kind of uh, 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 are you arguing that the first premise of the column begs the question? 
I'm saying the way Craig defends the Kalam, I guess defends the first premise of the Kalam, begs the question. Because what it comes out to is that what is meant by begins to exist or comes into being ends up just meaning the same thing as has a cause. So the first premise becomes trivial and the second premise just begs the question. Um, right. Right, because that's what it's supposed to prove, right? It's supposed to show that the universe has a cause. That's a good objection. Okay, I'm going to remember that now. Um, well, I'm not sure if it's a good objection yet. I'm still trying to hash that out with, with Alex. Um, so, so, I'm not sure if I understood the way, the way you were characterizing this the way I was thinking about it in my head. Could you try, um, could you repeat that, please? Well, I mean, I'm not sure that I'm getting it still. But so the way I the way I was thinking about it a moment ago is that then you said okay so it's like you're um it's like you're chasing him. So okay so the way I see it starting off is that you you have this kind of dialogue going where um Craig says something like the universe began to exist so it must have been caused to exist by something and you go not necessarily maybe it began to exist in the sense that it's finite to the past. But maybe that's all that there is, right? It doesn't have to be um, a cause for it. And he says, well, but if you take that route, then what you're saying is that it popped into existence out of, out of nothingness, which is absurd because, you know, why doesn't other stuff just randomly pop into existence out of nothingness or whatever his arguments are? Um, and then you say something like, well, but it's perfectly coherent to just say... Um, or, or I suppose really to stick to the way that you put it, it's just, he says something like, look, it's um, that just starting to exist thing um, is like the way that the B theory would say this, that the ruler starts to exist or something. Like that. But I'm talking about the A theory. And on the A theory, you can't say it like that. To which your reply is, yes, you can. It's just like saying there's this moment for which it's, it's never, it doesn't have any past or something. There's, you know, there aren't any moment. It's not like beforehand it was true to say that this moment will happen. Like to put it in a theory terms, it's just this moment where uh, it's presently true, and then it's it's in the past. And it, like that, and it's perfectly coherent from an a theory point of view. And he says, "All right, yeah, well, but." Um, uh, and then he wants to say something like, and then and then we've got to this point where you're like pushing him to try and explain what he meant by it being uh, says this another. <laughs> now I've lost it again because the, it's that last chunk, I mean maybe I'm just I've been working all day and uh, maybe I'm just too tired for this to sink in, I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult but um, so yeah blah 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 I'm trying to see how the A theory is going to be relevant blah blah blah, that's the A theory Reclarification. Then, okay, great. And then he says, okay, I grant there isn't any temporally prior state to the first moment of time, like on the A theory even. And so it seems it can't be, and uh, it seems I can't temporally countenance the coming to be of the universe. But why suppose I have to insist that coming to be should be countenance in that form? I can take it and say that the coming to be of the universe was temporally simultaneous, but causally prior. So the universe comes to be in the sense that it's a causal, albeit non-temporal antecedent. And in this sense, the first interval of space-time sprang into being. So he's still trying to say, look, it's absurd because it's still springing into being. Right? And the sense in which it's springing into being is it has this causal but non-temporal antecedent to it. Is that right up to that point? I... Um, well, just to make a clarification, the way I'm sort of viewing the dialogue is that we're sort of shaving away alternatives as to what he means by coming to be. So, so so we, the first route was sort of a reification route with nothingness. We dropped that because that's just not correct. And he says, well, that, you, can, you can do that on B theory, but not on A theory. And then I come in and say, well, no, even on A theory, your, your point doesn't, doesn't track because of this, right? And then he has to give up this idea that coming to be means having a temporally prior state or something. Or, where, or temporality mm -hmm. somehow comes into the into the into the into the mix in some sense. Mm -hmm. So the only other sense in which I can see coming to be being characterized there is where he he talks about elsewhere 
where he wants to distinguish causal priority from temporal priority. It's true that there are many causes that are also temporally prior to their effects, but given that he accepts simultaneous causation and coincident causation, there can also be causes which are not temporally prior to their effects, but nonetheless are causally prior to their effects, like the ball and pillow example from Kant. The depression is causally antecedent to the weight of the ball. Or um, now, when he makes that move, the idea is that he's given up the coming to be of the universe in, in some sense where temporality makes a difference. Instead, it's just a matter of having a causally antecedent state simpliter. But at that point, what he just means by coming to be is just having a causally antecedent state, which is the same thing as just saying that it has a cause of some sort. So every instance of coming to be or begins to exist in the Kalam just means has a cause. So he he can only characterize the coming to be of the universe to the extent that he's already putting forward the conclusion of the argument, which is that there's a cause of the universe or something. So, so there's a... Okay, so, so the idea that... Um, So, okay, so on the one hand, there's like the, uh, you're taking it as a definitional point on, by Craig. It, it still seems to me that there's something about this which is like sort of, you're saying, ultimately, the reason that it begs the question is because he's kind of built it into the definition of what it means to be um, coming into being or something causally, but not temporally, um, or having no causal having a temporal antecedent but just a causal one that you um, no, no no so you're building into the idea of there being a first moment that it has to be it has to have some kind of causal antecedent right right when he says that it begins to exist or it comes into being at time t equals zero what I'm saying is given the dialectic as I'm constructing it, the only way he can characterize the coming to be or the beginning to exist in the sense that's relevant to the Kalam is just the sense in which it has cause. When he says there's a right, causally antecedent state. I, I'm interpreting having a causally antecedent state as just meaning that there is a cause, if, if that's a fair assumption. So that there's a yeah, cause for the universe existing, but it exists simultaneously with the first moment of the universe. Well, I don't, I don't think, I guess the idea is that it's not before in a temporal sense, it's just causally prior. You know? So um, all he's saying is that there is a cause. So what, what Hypatia is contesting is that the first premise just boils down to the universe or, um, or um, well, let's see, everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist. The sense in which that's relevant, that's relevant. Um, right, is that the second premise is going to be equal to the conclusion in virtue of the fact that we've eliminated all these other options of what begins to exist means, right, based on what she's talking about coming into being is. So we've, we've eliminated all these other options for coming into being, like coming into being can't have a temporally prior state of nothingness, right? Um, and we've blocked whatever the A theory and B theory inferences uh, to say that, that the objection only works on B theory but not A theory, right? We're saying that that holds true um, for A theory as well. So it seems like all... You're saying when you're saying the universe begins to exist is the same as saying the universe has a cause, right? Because the only, the only sense we're familiar with this um, coming into being stuff is the sense in which there's a causally antecedent condition, right? And so that's the same thing as saying the universe has a cause. So I guess what she's contesting is that the second premise of the Kalam is the same as the conclusion given that we've shaken off all those other options. Yeah, I, 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 
<laughs> so I thought that the uh, the way that it went was um, maybe I'm maybe I've superimposed a step here, which is why I'm getting confused. But I thought the idea was that um, you you want to say to Craig like, look, maybe the universe just just is, right? Um, yeah, okay, it's finite to the past, but that just doesn't why who, why why should it be caused? Right? And he's right. saying. Right. Well, because if it's not caused, then it's just kind of absurd that it is, right, with no reason for it being or something. Um, and then, and that's where the dialogue starts, with you going, no, it isn't. <laughs> and, and, and him trying to find ways of saying why it is. And each time he says it, you're shaving off the ways that he can say that it's absurd. Is, is that right? I think so, yes. Right, so um, it would be absurd if, um, or, or he said something like, um, look, maybe it makes sense on the B theory for things to just start, right? But on the A theory, it can't work like that. And you're going, no, 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 even on the A theory, it's not absurd. Right, so he's trying to make it absurd. So should, what you're doing is saying, this makes perfect sense, dude. And he's going, no, no, it's really crazy what you're saying. Here's why, right? And each time he says, here's why, you're going, well, actually, that's not crazy. That's just like what I mean, because don't reify nothing, or even on the A theory, that's fine. And then he says, okay, look, the reason it's absurd is that, um, the reason that it's absurd that it just is um, all that there is or something is that actually um, what you mean by there being a first moment of time is that it's caused in this way of being caused, which is... Uh, like non-temporally prior cause, like it's still cause, like coming to be, or no, so just being the first moment of all that there is means the same, like it is being simultaneously caused, to exist. like self-creating or something, or some, you know, something existing at the same time that the first universe, like, I mean, okay, so if the, like the chair that's holding me up is simultaneously like it exists at the same time as the effect of, of me staying off the floor or something, right? So that's the sense of like it's kind of causally prior to me sitting up, but it's temporally simultaneous with me sitting up. Mm -hmm. right? And that's what he's saying here is that like, yeah, God is kind of temporally simultaneous with the universe, the first moment of the universe or something. He's kind of causally prior to it because like some, somehow, and this, this is a big like, Thing I don't really get what that means, but somehow he's the cause for it, even though uh, he exists at the same. It's a simultaneous. Right. right. I mean, in um, this in this dialectic, I'm not directly arguing against that view. Because I don't think I need to do that. You're not arguing against that view, no. But what you're arguing against is that um, we have to have that view, and and that that leads to the characterization being absurd. That is that is that right? I mean. We, so, so I mean, there's a there's a point in the dialogue where I talk about the alternatives and where he grasps the point about the alternatives. Like I'm saying, his principle leads to all of these really odd views, right? Some of which he acknowledges, like creatio ex nihilo, atemporal causation, not going from atemporal to then temporal, creating time at the first moment of time. You know, like there are all of these really odd things you have to say, right? The whole yeah. point, though, is Craig wants to say the alternative is just flat-out absurdity. So that's why we prefer this view. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. So he's trying to make your view seem absurd. Right? Well, well it's, not, it's not my view. The, the skeptic's view. But, the, the skeptic's view. Okay, whatever. Yeah, sure. Um, the skeptic's view to look absurd. And I'm saying the only way he does that I mean, the, the aim of this dialectic is to show that he can only say, not show, not so much show that it's absurd, but say that it's absurd to the extent that he begs the question. Because the idea is like, um, like realistic nihilists are saying, we're shaving off ways of interpreting this phrase, the universe comes to being. It can't be in this reified sense that we've rejected. Um, it's not something that even depends on any theory for reasons we've deduced. Um, so the only thing that seems to be left is just to say what I mean by begins to exist or coming into being is having some causally prior state. 
perhaps compatible with temporal simultaneity or something. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it has to be explicitly that it's temporally simultaneous. I mean, presumably it's compatible with either temporal simultaneity or temporal priority. It's just that causal pri it just it just requires causal priority mm -hmm. in some sense. And I'm saying to talk about causal priority just comes down to saying that there is a cause of this phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. um, so then the conclusion is, well, then all what you mean by comes into being, it has a cause. So you're saying my so, so view is absurd. absurd. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. No, 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 that's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask you to clarify that. So he's saying that your view is absurd on this final option because... Because the universe has a cause and you deny it. But that's presumably what's in question at the first place. Wait, that's why it's absurd? Really? Well, I'm saying that's that we're... I'm constructing the dialect of, to force him to be characterized and coming into being as. It can't be in this reified sense. It can't be something that depends on A theory or B theory or an intense theory of time. It can't be a matter of temporal priority. It just yeah, has to so come down to causal priority. So on the final view, he's trying to characterize the skeptic's defense as absurd, right? And um, we've run through all the other options. And the final one, he says, look, it's to say that the universe uh, wasn't caused by, because what you're denying the first premise that um, is that right that, that everything which ex begins to exist has a cause, right? Right. right? And then by denying it, he's saying denying it is absurd. Um, and it seems like on this final view, all, all the only thing that's absurd about denying it is that it's false. Because, like, by definition or something, um, it's, you know, it's causally, like, okay, so there's nothing before it, but it just kind of, like, just coming into being means just having an a, uh, antecedent cause or something to it. And that's it. But what's absurd about that? I mean, like, it seems to me that you could just go, well, okay, then. Like, I mean, if, if you want to say that... Um, the, I mean, I, I don't see any reason why you should... So on the, on the view under question, it seems to me that Craig's objective is to show that it's absurd, and um, uh, your what you've done is you've boxed him into having to say that what the view the only way that you can think of the view is uh, on, uh, as we were talking about, right? As it antecedent, causally antecedent, but not temporally antecedent. Um, not necessarily temporally antecedent. It, it doesn't have to be not temporally antecedent. It's just that it doesn't necessarily have to be temporally antecedent. Mm -hmm. And he has to show that that's absurd. And all you have to do is say that it, it, it isn't. Isn't that right? I mean, maybe that comes down to the same thing as what the dialectic is attempting to accomplish. Because, I mean, the idea is just to characterize his usage of the word coming to be or begins to exist. And what I want to say is that if on final analysis all that comes into being just means has a cause, then he's just charging the skeptic with having an absurd view because they deny the universe has a cause. It's just reiterating the skeptic's view, essentially. Right, um, right, right. I mean, I think he's I saying your view is wrong because it's wrong or something, which is presumably begging the question. Right, right, right. So um, if, if in that sense, um, I mean, I don't know if that would be equivalent to making the question um, the way you characterized it. Um, so are you, are you, like, what I'm, what I'm seeing you're talking about is the skeptic is accepting something like uh, temporal priority or even causal priority, right? Um, but what you're saying is that the only way Craig could mean the universe which it, presumably what he's supposed to show is that the universe has a cause, but the only thing that Craig could mean by the second premise is that the universe has a cause, right? Yeah, so I mean, this is, this is assuming the skeptic is accepting, let's say, scientific arguments to the, to the effect that the universe is past finite. Right. 
right. has a first interval of time. And he wants to say, in virtue of it having a first interval of time, in some sense it comes into being. Right, but right. I mean, obviously the first premise, the first premise isn't, um, like, the skeptic isn't, isn't denying some sort of pathology if they, if they deny the first premise, right? Everything that begins to exist has a cause. They're, what, they're, what they're accepting there is that um, it's some notion of temporal, temporal coming into being, right? Like, like mm-hmm. so they're obviously not saying something that, like, as vacuous as everything that has a cause has a cause, right? So it doesn't mean... Yeah, they're, they're not denying that. That's just a strict right. pathology. Right, so they wouldn't say anything that absurd. So when they're, when they're talking about coming into being, they're talking about something substantive, like having a temporal prior state. But obviously, um, that's not what Craig means, right? When he says the universe began to exist, given all the other objections we laid out, he doesn't mean that well, there's a temporarily, temporarily prior. Well, I don't know about I don't know about there being a temporally prior state. I mean, presumably the skeptic can believe that there are causally prior but temporally. Right. Right. Simultaneous cause. I mean, right. the, the point though is that you need to. There has to presumably he, he's giving you a reason to think that's the case of the universe or something. But right. what that the notion. What I'm saying is that the notion that the skeptic is talking about when they're talking about it coming into being is a temporal notion. Yeah, I mean, we can understand, we, when we say coming into being, I mean, my my point is, has always been that in some sense it begs the question of where did it come from? And right. that's why I always try to distinguish strictly beginning to exist from coming to exist. Because I understand begins to exist in the sense that we might say some X begins to exist at T, if and only if X exists at T, and there are no times prior to T at which X exists. And certainly, certainly the beginning of the universe was sounds like that. But when we're talking about coming into being, given that I understand coming into being to involve some notion of priority of some sort, um, we might say that something comes into being, at least in a temporal sense, if X exists at T, and there are times prior to T such that X does not exist. Now, those are distinct definitions. Right. Because while the universe satisfies the first definition, it does not satisfy the second. Because there are no times prior to T. Um, well, T equals zero. Um, so what I'm trying to do in this dialectic is, is trying to get Craig to clarify what does he mean by comes into being in the sense of... Um, that's relevant to the Kalam that, you know, the, the universe comes into being and hence requires a cause. Sorry. Right, because he says it comes into being at the first moment of time or whatever. I'm sorry, I had to step away. What were you um, so, yeah, so what I'm trying to accomplish with the dialectic, which I'm not sure if I'm succeeding at clarifying, <laughs> um, um, I'm just trying to get Craig to explicitly state out what he means by coming into being in the sense that's relevant to the Kalam when he says the universe comes into being and hence requires a cause, right? And we've gone through this reification of nothingness route and rejected that. We've gone through this distinction between uh, tensed and tenseless theories of times and and rejected that that it makes a difference to this to this argument. And um, the only place I can that I'm sort of pushing him towards is just to say that by comes into being, all he can really say about it is just that it has a cause, the sense of having a causally antecedent state. Um, but if that's all he means by comes into being then he's directly begging the question in the sense that when he's, and every time he says the universe comes to being, he just means has a cause. Well, that's precisely what's at, at dispute. Right, right, because you want to be able to say, but, well, does it have a cause? Right. You don't want it to be a matter of definition, that it does because it comes into existence, or that it does because it has a first moment. Is that right? I mean, what, what, right. 
mean, because the skeptic isn't denying something as trivial as everything that has a cause has a cause. Yeah, right? of course. Um, what's a dispute is that the universe has a cause. Yeah, yeah, way. yeah. And so is it the last route is him saying, look, having a first moment means having a cause in this sense of having a cause. And you're saying, well, if, if it means that, then you're begging the question, right? I mean, like, because there seems to be an actual question of, like, does it have a cause? I mean, and to which the answer could easily be no. You don't want it to be, well, it does, because, like, kind of by definition it does. And if it was, then that would be begging the question. Well, it wouldn't, right. I don't suppose it would be begging the question, but it would be to trivialize the whole thing. Sort of settling it by fiat before we start talking. Is, it, is that right? Is that characterizing what's going on? I think that's right. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure if I understand this bit, but we're saying settling it by. I was just characterizing it as begging the question. I don't know about so, so settling. Look, maybe the if I um, give an analogy, then maybe if I said something like, "Look, um, every, everybody's got friends, right?" And then, and you say. Well, uh, oh, Jimmy over there doesn't have any friends, right? And and then you go, damn it! I'm determined to stick to my thesis that everybody's got friends, despite this apparent counterexample that over there there's Jimmy doesn't have any friends. And you go, well, um, there is a sense in which he's got friends, and it's this kind of contrived and unusual sense where you say something like, you know, he he might not have any like kind of physical friends, but he's kind of got these like imaginary friends anyway so like kind of anyone by definition has imaginary friends or, or something maybe this is a better way of a better analogy so something like he's friends with himself so you know everybody's got friends right just being a person at all means that you've got friends because everybody's friends with themselves or something and you go look a minute ago you said everybody's got friends i took that to be a substantive claim and didn't realize what you meant by having a friend kind of had by definition everybody's got friends because you know, you stipulate artificially that everyone's friends with themselves or something, right? So, like, your your complaint is the only way you can make that statement true is by tagging on this kind of ad hoc um, solution at the end, which makes it true by definition. You're saying, well, okay, yeah, that would that would be the case if I was to grant you this kind of unusual definition, then you would be right. But like, um, if I was to grant you that unusual definition, we would have already settled the important question, or the interesting question, or whatever. Right? Does that, does that characterize it? Um, it? It might. So, I mean, the skeptic is starting out with this view that, for the sake of argument, they might believe that the universe begins to exist, in the sense of having a first interval of space, time, or whatever. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then the idea is that Craig wants to say in some, such, in some sense that means it comes into being. And then we have to go through all the steps of, well, what does he mean when he says it comes into being? And then we come down to him just saying that it just means it has a cause. Um, so then his attribution that being the first interval of time just requires that it comes into being in the sense of it having a cause. That's the sense in which I mean that it's question begging. Like, is it in fact the case that if what he means by comes into being is has a cause, then presumably it's an open question as to whether or not the universe has a cause, right? Mm -hmm. um, he can't just say that the universe comes into being if all he means is has a cause, because that's the whole point of the argument, to show that that's the case, not just to say that. Yeah, because he's saying that being the first moment of time means having a cause. Because, I mean, couldn't you distinguish between, okay, there's on the one hand being the first moment of time with no causally prior or simultaneous, uh, sorry, it's causally antecedent, uh, temporally prior or simultaneous uh, cause. <laughs> and then another case, which is um, being the first moment of time and having uh, such a cause. Like, they're two distinct right. cases, and right. like, presumably the question would be like empirically or something. Which one is it? Right? Well, ma at least you know, matter. Right. Of fact, I mean, it would be a question of which which definition applies. 
Exactly. So then it's a question of like building into the definition. So it's like if you're just saying by definition being a first moment of time means having uh, a cause, then okay, yeah, of course, um, it would follow, but I'm not going to grant that that's the like right definition to use. Right? I mean, so, so I, I, think I, I think I kind of was on the right track at the beginning, but I think it's taken me a long time this evening for some reason. But it's, it's part of the it's like a semantic thing. You're saying if like if the only place you can go to it is by just saying, well, if by what I um, by being the first moment, I just take take that to mean that that it's caused. It's kind of a semantic issue. Does that seem right? I'm sorry. Give me one moment. Give me one moment. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Um. um so, right, I mean, it, it, it comes down to the way you're characterizing it, which definition applies, mm-hmm. right? Um, um, because because when, when in the example you use with the friend, um, when we're talking about a friend, presumably we both agree that by friend we mean, you know, some other person or something. Yeah, yeah, distinct. And, and if you and and if you, you then said whatever satisfies X has a friend, um, but then it turns out all you mean by X is is having a friend in this relevant sense. That leaves mm-hmm. open to whether or not this person has a friend. Mm-hmm. And if you just say that they have a friend, then then you're just begging the question in that sense. <laughs> Because your argument would just come down to whatever has X has a friend. This entity satisfies X, so this entity has a friend. Yes. But if having X just means has a friend, then the argument is question begging. The first premise is trivial. The second premise is identical to the conclusion. Mm-hmm. So I think I think I can't see a way anyway of Craig making this route more successful. I'm finding it difficult to even. Uh, See, see it as a coherent answer at all, and even just for the sake of argument. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm going to have very much useful feedback, at least not now. Maybe I have to think about it longer, or maybe uh, have more more to say later on. Um, I'm sorry, maybe I, I didn't, I didn't quite hear what, hear what you said. Sorry. So, um, I, I think I, all I can do at this point is just simply agree. I think agree that the the move is successful. Right. I can't see. Craig making that move more, that his move at the end more plausible and avoid the question begging. I, I already, I already find it difficult to see uh, where he could go at that point. Um, and, and I think I, I'll probably need some more time to mull it over before I can say anything constructive. Um, maybe I can take the opportunity to pick your brains about a different thing that I've been thinking about today. Oh, sure. Definitely. Um, so um, I've been thinking about this paper by um, Anderson and Welty called The Law oh, of Non-Contradiction. Oh, Law of Non-Contradiction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. I've read that. So you've read, you've read the paper, okay, good. Oh, a while so, ago, yes. Right. They make this argument. It's not quite clear what the argument exactly is, as they don't state it in premise conclusion form, which, which is annoying. but it, it seems they to me don't? That a certain they don't? No. Like a section no. where they are. Uh, let me, let me double check. I could have sworn that they, they Well, they have, um, they have section headings, and in each section they defend the, the proposition that's advanced in the heading. Um, but if you line those up together, they don't make an argument. And uh, they summarize what the argument is in the final paragraph, but then that argument doesn't match quite doesn't work properly if you map it to the section headings. So I think I can reconstruct the argument as charitably as possible, which is something like, the important move anyway, is to say something like, well, so the the laws of logic are considered to be propositions, um, and and it's it's argued that the laws of logic are necessarily true, um, a proposition which is necessarily true exists in all possible worlds, they say. Um, 
and then they and then and then they say something like uh, so, so so here's the bit that I want to focus on, which is something like propositions are intentional. Everything that's intentional is mental. I, a thought right. or something. Um, intention. Everything that's intentional is mental. Therefore, um, propositions are mental. Uh, and then they they continue to move on from that to say that. And I think there's a there's a some kind of fallacy which is like um, that there are these necessarily existing thoughts or whatever, and therefore there must be a necessarily existing mind that thinks them. And I think that that doesn't follow, but um, I'm interested in this. Oh, just thinking. some type of quantifier shifter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like everyone has a mother too. There is a person that mothers everyone. Right, right, right. There's something along those lines, and you can construct uh, a model that satisfies those premises that, that has like lots of gods taking it in turns to think the, the laws of logic or something. Right? It doesn't mean that that there just has to be um, some mind. Uh, uh, thinking those necessary. The, the well, well, there could be three. <laughs> yeah, one for exactly. identity, like, one for non contradiction, <laughs> yeah. one for excluded middle. Yeah, which is an answer that I think some people will snap up because then I'll say, yeah, oh, that's the Son, the Father, and the Holy Ghost, or whatever. Like, anyway. <laughs> um, but so propositions are intentional. Inten- anything is intentional is mental. Right, that's the. Those are the two premises. I see, kind of like I, I can feel that there's some issue going on there, which because it seems to me that the conclusion that pops out of them, which is the propositions are mental, just seems to me wrong. Um, but I, I'm, I'm finding it hard to sort of see where the error lies in it because so, and and I think part of the problem is that like the definite like you know propositions, the nature kind of metaphysical status of a proposition. It's always something where, like, the, the, I never really made my mind up about it, and I, I don't really have very strong views, but I know that there's lots of different views around. And, I mean, so Mill and early Russell have a view where, like, um, Mount Blanc can be, is actually part of the proposition, Mount Blanc is over a thousand feet tall or something. It's actually right. a mountain right. itself that's part it's of the Is that the structure of proposition two? I forget what it's called, precisely. Um, I, I, don't, I can't remember what the, the theory is called, but okay. I suppose it's the, right. the, 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 the idea is that it's something that... The, 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 the involves actual... The, the reference plays constituents to the, uh, to the proposition itself. Yeah, 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 itself. right. So it's not like... Um, it doesn't have a placeholder that itself refers to Mount Blanc, the thing. Right. Well, he actually so argues Mark. against that. Or actually, I think it might have been Gould and Davis, but like in the recent um, anthology on theism and abstract objects... Mm-hmm. Um, there's a section, I think, where it might have either been Welty or Gould and Davis who have a similar view to Welty and Anderson where they argue against the pursuing view. But, but at any rate, yeah. Um, okay, but, well, does that mean on the Russellian view, on that early Russellian million view, is that enough to mean that the proposition is not intentional? I mean, it's unclear to me that that's the case. They don't so, think it's representational. They take prop. They take. They take it that propositions have to be about the um, the states of affairs or whatever that they express. Um, that that aboutness is representational in some fashion. That's where the intentionality is coming from. Mm-hmm. And that a merely um, like a silly view that you're characterizing, which just involves just just having you know the, the constituents of the proposition or something. Mm-hmm. Um, just existing, and then maybe some relation over them. Uh, mm-hmm. That's enough to get you representation. You need something stronger. And they want to say it starts resembling something mentalistic. Okay, so on the Russellian view, then, all you get is representationality or something and not intentionality. For the proposition. Uh, no, I, I don't think they would even grab representationality because I mean they would di- they would distinguish between like derived and intrinsic intentionality. Yeah, okay. Like so you might say like that, that yeah. tree rings have derived intentionality in the sense that they quote represent the age of the tree. 
all you can really say is that, that there's causal covariation to which we can attribute representation in the way that my reflection in a puddle is about me in some way. But it's not about me intrinsically. It's something that I'm attributing to the mirror, the same way I'm attributing it to the uh, tree rings. So at least on this view, you could certainly say that propositions have uh, only derived intentionality and not intrinsic intentionality, inherent intentionality. Mm -hmm. right? um, well, that's what they want to say. Yes. That's what, sorry, that's what Russell and Mill or whoever want to say. Is that what you're saying? Um, no, I, I'm sorry. But by they, I meant Welke and Anderson. They, so they want to say on this Russellian view. Sorry, sorry, carry on, finish your sentence. Um, no, on the Russellian, yes, on the Russellian view, well, I'm actually not entirely sure. I think the most that they would say is that if you want to characterize the Russellian view as having representation at all, it can only be to the extent that we attribute representationality over and above the mere constituents of the proposition, like um, if the cat is on the map, the constituents might be the map, the cat, some sat on relation or something. Mm -hmm. um, um, but they want to say that that's not sufficient to say then that the proposition is somehow about anything. Mm -hmm. To get the aboutness, we, it can only be in a derived sense in which we attribute aboutness to it in the way that pictures are about things or words are about things. Yeah, or my reflection right, right. in the mirror is about me. And they want to say that intrinsic intentionality can only come from a mind. Yes, exactly. Yeah, right, right, right. So, uh, cause, so I feel like I'm argue. I want to argue. I feel like they argue uh, Barbara, right? And I want to do Cesaro to the Barbara, which is a bit like doing a modus tollens to a modus ponens, right? So, they say something like uh, everything that's intentional. Sorry, everything that's a proposition is intentional. Everything that's intentional is mental, therefore everything that's a proposition is mental. And I want to say um, something like uh, not um, everything which is a proposition is intentional. Um, and then I can grant everything that's intentional is mental, but the conclusion doesn't follow. So it's not everything that's propositional is mental, right? So if, if, if it's the I, idea that, uh, so I'm not quite sure if I'm following, are you saying that either propositions aren't intentional or that not everything that's intentional is mental? Yeah, so not everything that's intentional is mental because there are, well, okay, so, so there's, there are two lines of argument, I'm kind of fudging them, right? First, the, I think it's defensible at least, the Russell view um, on that view, propositions are not intentional, right? Then there's another view, which mm -hmm. I kind of just generally think of as the normal view, which is like, so I have a propositional attitude of like belief that say, uh, this is a glass with some whiskey in it. Right? Um, but my belief, the mental um, aspect of it should be distinguished from the proposition, um, right? The proposition isn't mental, the proposition is like, another thing. Um, the proposition is the contents of your beliefs and, and so yeah, forth. Yeah, exactly. Right, it right, can't right. be so identical think, to the belief itself. That's it, exactly. Um, so, the hell was some weird noise going on? I think someone is calling via G+. Someone's calling me. Yeah, I'm going to have to hang up on that. Okay, sorry. Right, right, right. So, um, yeah, right. So, on this normal view, while propositions are intentional for the sake of argument, let's say they are about things, nonetheless they're not mental, right? They are non-mental intentional objects. And that stops you from saying the other generalization, the second one, which is that everything right. is intentional is, is mental. So I can see two lines of argument where one on which you grant the first premise but not deny the second, and on the other one you do the other way around, you grant the second premise but deny the first. Right yeah, I mean, there are people in the literature with respect to this argument that make both of those moves. Like, I know there's a paper by a guy named 
I don't remember, C.P. Ruloff, R-U-L-O-F-F, -F, that basically takes the second view where they argue that there can be Frasian propositions as contrasted mm -hmm. with a Massilian view of propositions, like some, some notion of, um, like, I mean, Frasian calls them concepts, but they're not actually concepts in the sense of being mental. Um, they're sort of, they have... Uh, yes, right, right. intrinsic intentionality. They are genuinely about things, but they're nonetheless not mental entities at all. In fact, yes. they're what figure into the contents of mental states to begin with. Yes, exactly. So, that. so they um, are in a contradiction, they cannot themselves yeah. be mental states. I'm sorry, I, I, I talked over you. What did you say? No, I think it's just a translational difference. I mean, I've seen that translated as ideas and concepts in different places, but obviously that's just um, mm -hmm. that's just authors picking their favourite English substitute for whatever. Well, I mean, he calls them Gedanken, if I'm not mistaken. Like right, him. right. Um, but but all I'm just saying is that Frege doesn't think that they're actually actually mental entities in any way. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's that's good. So I, uh, I mean, so what I'm just trying to raise a couple, I'm trying to put forward a couple of lines of argument that like um, it's, I don't think a, it's easy to put like a refutation of this paper as such, but it's I kind of just want to mm -hmm. put a few spanners in the work and... Um, Were you directed to this by Jimmy Stevens by any chance? Uh, well... Because I've I seen that he had uh, commented on your your G plus page. Um, yeah, no, I... I had been, so I'd been thinking about this before. Um, this guy, Blake Junter, sent it to me about... Um, oh, Blake. I see. Yeah. But Nothing that was the first time I saw it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, that, that, and, and I'd been thinking about this before, but I suppose recently because he, uh, him and someone else had, had brought it up to me, and I thought, oh, yeah, I had a bunch of stuff sitting around there. Um, but I want to sharpen that argument up. So I might, what I might do is uh, send you something to have a look at, if you don't mind, at some point in the next couple of days. Oh, definitely, because yeah, we've, been actually, we've been actually going through this issue ourselves. Okay, good. Um, because there's, like a, like he was mentioning in the slide chat, um, there's an anthology by Craig and, is it Craig and, Gould? oh no, it's edited by Paul Gould, I'm sorry. But it has like, William Lane Craig, Paul Gould, it has Welty in there actually as well, hmm. where they all list their views on the relationship between theism and abstract objects. Right, right, and right. Yeah, no, I think I saw Welty that. defends the view in more detail that he outlines in this paper, um, that abstract objects are um, mental entities in the divine mind or something. Yeah. Divine conceptualism or whatever it is. Yes, exactly. Yeah, right, right. Gould defends a slightly different view. But I think both of them argue at length, well, I don't know how long, but they argue that propositions have to be uh, intentional objects in some sense. Mm -hmm. And they want to reject both um, the sort of what they see as a non-representational Russellian view, and they also want to reject the sort of more platonistic or... Freakian view. Mm -hmm. um, I guess partly because they are just being unintelligible or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, look, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to duck out of this now because I'm supposed to go and join a different group um, on JD Kane on his hangout. Uh, so can I? Oh, was it Tuesday? Send you? Tuesday? Yeah, it's Tuesday. Oh. Oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I might have gotten an invite to that myself. Let me check. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, um, right. Right. Right, but um, yes, so I will send you something to have a read of in the next couple of days. Anyway. Sure. Um, and, and I'll send you some more. resources uh, regarding my, my argument or whatever. If you want to follow mm -hmm. up on that at all. Yes. But I'd definitely definitely. be interested in anything on divine conceptions that you come up with. Yeah, good. Okay, great. So let's call it a day here for now, and then um, I'll either see you in there in a minute, or we'll continue this in a few days. Sure. Nice talking with you. Okay. Nice. Yes, absolutely.
definitely.